Today, on Commitment to Truth. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, He is calling you. Each one of us, as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, is called by God for a specific purpose. If you don't know what that is, there's a reason for that. If you don't know what you've been called to do by God, it's because you're playing with sin and God can't get to you. Welcome to Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Each week, Pastor Cedric Brown and the pastoral team at Commitment Church strive to draw you into a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This week, we'll be starting a sermon series called Heroes. We'll learn from the biblical heroes of the past found in Hebrews 11 and by faith to encourage you to become today's heroes of the faith. Here's Pastor Ken Jones, teaching pastor at Commitment Church, with today's message. Today, we're going to talk about Moses. Now, before I get started, I have to say this. In order to do <clears throat> the history of Moses, to walk our way through Moses' life, let's just say that it took Charlton Heston four hours to do it. And he only got to the Ten Commandments. Uh, I don't plan on preaching until 4 o'clock this afternoon, so I will be kind enough to tell you that we're going to do a very small part of Moses' life, but I want to show you through this small portion of Moses' life how we are just like Moses, or maybe the other way around, Moses is just like us, uh, and I hope I can show you that as we go through this today. Uh, as a quick review, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The definition of faith, and I'm on the wrong verse, it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And something I saw in a commentary, it said that the idea of assurance provides a conviction for what we hope will happen, not because we can make it happen, but because God said it will happen. So we have a faith that... It's almost like a faith that knows. Our trust in what Jose talked about, that shed blood on the cross of Calvary, I don't know about you, but there's no shadow of doubt in me. And if one comes, it's fleeting, and God takes it away. Because I know, what's it say in Timothy? We can know that we're saved. And that's the precious gift of faith. But the faith we're talking about here is not just that saving faith, but the faith in knowing that God's got this, that God's going to take care of this. And this is what happened with Moses. So we're going to talk a little bit about Moses, and let's get started in Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to talk about the call of God and Moses' right response to God's call. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And let me start. I want to go through a quick history, real fast, for Moses, okay? Uh, remember, Pastor Jose took, preached about Joseph a couple weeks back. And Joseph went down to Egypt. He provided, you know, he became a, a leader in the land. He pr provided for a famine, provided food. Jacob and all the kids came down and lived in Egypt. The sin of the people, I just want to throw this in there, is that they never went back. When the famine was over, they should have gone back to the land that God had promised them, but they never did. They stayed. Now, eventually, uh, Pharaoh died. His kids come in and take over, and eventually they get to a bunch of pharaohs that did not know who Joseph was. All he saw was this group of foreigners that were becoming more numerous than his own people. And through fear that they would just walk over him and take over the country, he enslaved them. God allowed that to happen as the consequence of sin. And so now they were now enslaved in this country. And he also said that since we don't want to have a whole lot more kids running around, you're going to kill the, first, the, the males uh, that are born. So that's why we get into Moses, and Moses being floating around in a basket heading down the Nile River 
because when he was born, the, the Egyptian midwife felt sorry for the families and what was going on and didn't agree with what was going on, and they allowed Moses' his mom to put him in a basket and float him down the river. Hopefully, some Egyptian would pick him up and take care of him, which is exactly what happened. Pharaoh's daughter picked him up said, oh, wow, look at a cute little baby. And, of course, Moses' sister just happened to be running alongside at the time, and she says, hey, how about if I take this child, I'll take him to his mom and let him get weaned. And then I'll bring him back. She goes, yeah, do it. So Moses actually got to be initially raised by his own parents in his own home by his own mama. Uh, weaning in this process here was anywhere from two to five years. So you can understand how Moses would know that his people were Hebrews because he spent that much time in his youth with his people before he ended up going and living with uh, Miss Pharaoh. Okay, so now we got that little history thing coming on. Um, Moses then finally grows up as an older teenager, and he's starting to identify with himself with his own people. And he sees a fight going on between a soldier and a Hebrew, and he gets upset, goes, kills the soldier, thinks this is the right thing to do. Hey, I'm going to lead by this. And then the next day, he sees a couple of Hebrews fight with each other. He goes, hey, what are you guys fighting with each other for? I don't get this. And they said, oh, you're going to kill us too, like you did that soldier? And he went, uh-oh. Pharaoh found out what he did, was after him, so he took off and ran away to a place called Midian. And we're going to pick it up there. Exodus chapter 3, we'll start in verse 1. Now Moses was pasturing, pasturing the flock of Jethro's father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he, he meaning God, said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So here we have the burning bush incident, where Moses finally gets to hear from God. Every re piece of research I did on Moses' life, he did not get a call from God until now. And we're going to go on the assumption that by this time, he's somewhere in his 30s. Okay? So even though... We know Moses, and we know he was called to be the great leader that cooked the people out of Israel. He didn't receive that calling until he's here. Uh, Moses' response, Exodus 3, verses 10 to 12, says, Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. So this is the sending of God. So now Moses knows his mission. It's clear. God says, go, Egypt, take the people out, come here, back on this mountain. Okay? All right. Verses 16 to 17, chapter 3. God continuing to give Moses his instructions. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey. So that's what he's supposed to do. His job is to go into Egypt, grab a hold of the Israelites, take them out of Egypt, and march them back to the Promised Land which they had, should have done a little over 400 years before that, and they didn't do. So now Moses is going to do it through God's leadership. So, Exodus chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt, and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. 
Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. So Moses responded positively. Okay, God calls. Moses says, okay, I'm going to go. That was the good part of Moses' response to God. However, there is a wrong response that Moses also interjected in his response to God's call. Uh, Back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. Moses' first negative response. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? So his first thing is, Why me? (laughs) Who am I? I'm nobody. I'm nothing. Why should I be the one to go? Then we go down to verses 13 and 14 of Exodus chapter 3. And Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you will say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So now Moses is now questioning, you know, well, okay, well, they're going to say, well, who, you know, who sent you? you know, so now he's got this first problem of saying, who am I? Because I ain't nobody. And then it's like, well, they're not going to trust me because I'm not with them. See, I'm out here in Midian running around with a bunch of sheep. So they're going to give me questions. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses said, what if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? But they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So again, there's this questioning. Yeah. Who am I? Who, am I? Who, sent you? Who sent me? They're not going to believe me anyhow. Now here he is trying to get out of what God has called him to do. Verse 10 of chapter 4. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent. Neither recently, nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Doesn't sound like he's too slow of tongue to me, but now he's got another excuse. I don't know how to talk right. Verse 13, chapter 4. But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. In other words, send somebody else because I don't want to go. So Moses came out with this whole list. I call it the excuse towel. Uh, <laughs> in my younger years, when I was an avid golfer, for Christmas one time, my kids bought me this towel to use while I was golfing. It was called an excuse towel. You know, like a bird flew over and hit my ball, or you know, for well, some reason why my ball went in the woods, or why I missed that putt. It was an excuse towel. It was like 27 different excuses for why I couldn't hit a golf ball. Uh, true to this day. Uh, So here Moses has got his excuse to all of the reasons why he can't be the guy to go. Now, there's some consequences because we see, I read to you already, right? Moses finally said he would go. So he did go. And he did finally agree to follow God's call. But there was a delay in that while he tried to get out of it. But there are consequences to some of his wrong responses that I want to kind of show to you here. The first one is in verse 14 of chapter 4. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. Now, I don't know about you, but that phrase would scare me more than anything else. What does it say in Psalms? Don't fear the one that can take your body. Fear the one that can take your soul. Uh, I, I would be scared to death if while well, so I'm standing there talking to a burning bush, <laughs> the burning bush is mad at me. Uh, that's a scary thing to fall into the hands of a living God. <clears throat> and I think Moses realized that. I think that's why he said, okay, I'll go. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I know uh, when you're having those discussions with your wife, giving her all the reasons why you really don't want to take the trash out, and then eventually you finally say, okay, I'll do it. Because you ran out of excuses for why you shouldn't. And you could see the steam rising. <laughs> and you finally go, you know what, I better take that trash out because I'm going to pay dearly for this. 
And I think that's how Moses was responding here. It was finally like, you know, if God's mad at me, I better get this done. Thank you for joining us for today's message from Commitment to Truth. We'll continue with the second part of the message right after this. Hello, my name is Norberto Colon Jr. and I'm a ministry leader for the worship ministry at Commitment Church, a place for all nations. I would like to personally invite you to come to one of our events this month. For the latest events, you can visit commitmentchurch.org slash events. And if you and your family are looking for a church, we're here on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Thank you again for joining us for today's message from Commitment to Truth. We now return for the second half of our message. All right, another one. Uh, consequence here, Exodus chapter 4, uh, finishing verse 14, going through to verse 16. Uh, it says, and he said, this is God speaking to Moses, uh, and he said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what to, you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. So God solved his speech problem by providing his brother to speak for him. The problem with that is that what I call partial obedience brings about the consequences of the sin of arguing with God. Because Aaron really should not have been his spokesman. God was his spokesman. But this instance of lack of faith on Moses' part, more, I think, fear than anything, brings about its own set of consequences for its own sin. And let's take a look at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 4. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, this is when he's getting the Ten Commandments, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Aaron turned them into idol worshipers. Aaron made them forget God. Aaron shouldn't have been there to begin with. But because of Moses' sin, the people sinned. The consequence of Moses' sin was what Aaron did with the people. Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? So now he's got, here's Aaron questioning Moses' authority. If there, and this is, I mean, we're in numbers now, right? So we've already gone through the Ten Commandments and all the rest of that. We've already crossed the Red Sea. We've already gotten water from the rock. And now Aaron's questioning Moses' authority. Aaron shouldn't have been in that position to begin with. But because of Moses' sin, the consequence continued of Aaron thinking he was more than he should have. Another interesting thing that happens to Moses, Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 to 26. Now, it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Now, this is the Lord that wants to put Moses to death as he's leaving Midian, heading for Egypt with his wife and kids on a donkey. Then Zipporah, his wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, you are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he, God, let him alone. At that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Moses never circumcised his kid. 
It's supposed to be done on the eighth day. We're talking years. Why? We'll see later. This is when I, when I get to the end of this. One of Moses' problems, and if you think about him going through all these excuses, is that he keeps talking about himself. I can't do this. I can't do that. I want to do this. Remember, I told you before, a couple weeks ago, circumcision, the sign of circumcision was the sign of the covenant and the sign of being obedient to God for the promise that he made. And it's like a, a, a contract that God says, okay, I'm going to give you the land. This is for you. You're going to have all these kids, and you're going to be a great nation. And your sign of the contract, your signature is circumcision of your boys. So you'll all be circumcised. Moses never circumcised his kid, which means he didn't trust God to be the leader of that covenant. He never really trusted the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because if he had, he would have been obedient in circumcision. And he didn't. So now he's got marital problems because the poor took the kids and went home. And he ended up going to Egypt without them. But later on in the story, you see Jethro comes and meets up with them after they've crossed the Red Sea and brings the wife and kids back. So you see these issues, these consequences that Moses had. Look, the, the, the nation, how do I say this? Moses is probably, in, in my mind, which is pretty small, but the greatest national leader in history. If you think about one man taking over a million people out of a nation where they're enslaved, taking all of their goods, their gold, their animals, their food, and everything else, and marching them out, crossing the Red Sea, going into the desert of Saudi Arabia, wandering for 40 years in a desert to get the people into the promised land. Can you name another na national leader that did that? Really? I mean, it, it single-handedly probably one of the greatest things that's ever happened, which is why Moses is so revered by the Jews. I mean, what did they say to Jesus? Who do you think you are, Moses? Right? I mean, they got Moses way up there on the pedestal because really what he did was pretty awesome once he allowed God to work through him. He just had to get to that point of understanding, and that's where his faith finally came in, right? Because he finally did what God told him to do, and he finally followed God. But you see the consequences of delayed obedience. So what's this mean for us? How do we, in our lives, compare to what happened to Moses as he began his life? Number one, we're all called. Whether you like it or not. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, he is calling you. Ephesians, please, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Verses 8 and 9 are very popular verses for us in memory work. Um, but 10 is the one I want to focus on. But let's start at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in that. God has a very specific work that he has chosen for you to do. Each one of us, as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, is called by God for a specific purpose. If you don't know what that is, there's a reason for that, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, <clears throat> I have down here, I think, 17 verses. No, I'm not going to read them. I should, but I won't. But you'll see them listed in the engage questions over about when you know you've been called by God. I would encourage you to read those verses. Because once you're done, you're going to realize that, yeah, God's calling me.
Now, in the process of this calling, and what I want you to see, the change, I mean, the, the, the comparison between us and Moses, we're going to sin. Anybody here perfect? Anybody? <laughs> no, of course not. Because that sin nature we still battle with, right? Let's go to 1 John, please, chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 5. I'm going to go through to chapter 2. It says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, of Jesus his son, cleanses us from all sin. Listen. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We are going to sin. So yes, we're called. But yes, in the process of being a Christian, we're going to sin. But we take care of that sin through confession. And my favorite word, repentance. Uh, look at Romans 3.23. In case you're questioning, we all know the verse, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we've all sinned, every one of us, and we're going to sin even after our salvation. And in case we think we're special, Romans 7. Right, Larry? Romans 7. <laughs> Larry's taught me this one. Verses 18 to 25. Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do I do not, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Here's the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul, probably one of the most intelligent guys as far as biblical writers is concerned, he's wrote a whole bunch of scripture, struggled with the concept of sin in his life after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. We all do. It's just who we are. That doesn't mean we don't answer the call, but it means to recognize the fact that there's, even after we've answered the call, just as Moses did, there was still sin. And I'll get to that in a minute. And there's consequences of sin. Colossians 3.25 says, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. So you need to understand that, yes, we're called. Yes, we will sin in spite of that call. And we may be forgiven, but there's still consequences of our sin. Okay? Don't think you're not forgiven because something bad happens to you because you did something wrong. You're still forgiven but you still got to deal with the consequence of that sin. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So we are what we do. When we sin, there's consequence. But what I want to explain to you, what I want to show you, is that through the life of Moses, we see how God feels about sin. 
Go to Numbers, please, chapter 20. I won't bounce back here to Moses. I know. Numbers, chapter 20, verses 8 through 12. God's speaking to Moses here. Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation, and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you from this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drank. What's the big oops here? Well, God said, speak to the rock. Instead, he smacked it because he was mad at the people. That's why he called them a bunch of rebels because they were whining and complaining. They did nothing but whine and complain for 40 years. And he was tired of it, and he was angry. But that's not why God got mad at him. God got mad at him because he said, shall we bring you water out of this rock? It took God's glory. He put himself in the place of God. And God's like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. The consequence of sin, Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 4 and 5. Then the Lord said to him, Moses, this is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Moses never got to the promised land. After all the stuff he put up with, with that million or so stiff-necked people, and the Pharaoh, and the Red Sea, and man, face to face with God, the guy glowed, right? Yet he never got to go to the promised land because he put himself in the place of God. And the consequence of that sin was he never got to go where he was going to go. God hates sin, no matter who it is that's doing it. And ladies and gentlemen, sin is sin is sin. There's no, I don't see anyone in the Bible who said, this is a big sin and this is a little sin. Murder is a little white lie. All bring about the same consequence. Death. We sometimes play with sin. If you don't know what you've been called to do by God, it's because you're playing with sin and God can't get to you. You can't hear him because there's stuff between you and God. My encouragement to you today is to do two things. First, ask God what's in the way. Ask him to reveal to you what it is in your life that is between you and him so that you can repent of it and get it out of the way. So you can clearly hear from God. Which is, when we do communion, that's my prayer every single time. If there's anything between me and you, God, show it to me now. So I could dump it right here at the altar. And then the second thing is, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but ask him, all right, God, what do you want me to do? Why am I here? What is the specific chore you have for me? Because I know there's one there. And I don't know if I'm doing it or not. Shucks, I ask him whether or not I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm here. Because <laughs> I only want to do what God's got for me. Anything else is a waste of time. Anything else won't be blessed by God, and it won't be successful. Because our success is found in him. 
So I want to encourage you guys, man. Dump the sin. Stop playing. Let God reveal to you what it is that's in the way so that you can dump it and get rid of it and get it out of the way. And then ask, God, show me so that I can respond. And don't respond like Moses. Who, me? <laughs> Look, I did that when I was 17, and I paid for that one. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Just respond like whatever. I don't care what it is. I really don't care what it costs. Because I ain't taking nothing with me but whatever I've done for Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you show us these wonderful examples of men and women who are labeled as heroes. But yet they struggled in their lives just like we do. Father, help us to learn from that, that you've called us to do exactly the same great and wonderful things that you called them to do. And that we can be the same heroes that they were. Father, we've got to respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for listening to our series, From Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. If you want to listen to the previous messages in this series, or if you want to hear messages from other series, visit Commitment Church on YouTube or Pastor Cedric Brown on Spotify, Pandora, or other podcast providers. You can also visit us on our website, commitmentchurch.org. And if you live in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey area, we would love to see you in person as well. You can attend any of our services by visiting us at 2 Berlin Road South, Lindenwald, New Jersey, 08021. Thank you again for listening, and have a blessed and wonderful day.